Hello everyone, this is Fluke Xelix. We are about to begin our webinar. We're going to wait until everyone is in the webinar, so give it a few more minutes and then we'll start the presentation. Hello and thanks for joining us today. The webinar will begin in just a minute or so. We're going to wait until everyone is logged in. Hello everyone, we're going to get started with some basic housekeeping and introductory information. My name is Leah Freeberg from Fluke Excelix, and thank you for joining us for this best practices webinar. I'm sure you all know Fluke is our yellow tool provider and you may also know that we produce some of the industry's fav most favorite reliability tools, even infrared cameras and vibration meters. But you may not know that many of the measurements that our tools collect now flow automatically into the EIM systems of record. It happens via a framework that we call Fluke Excelix. Our goal is to better connect asset management data into existing asset management systems, and it all turns around best practices in condition-based maintenance. So that's why this series of webinars explores reliability maintenance strategies, and that's why we feature speakers from a variety of expert backgrounds. So before we start, we have a couple of housekeeping items. Today's session is being recorded, so your phone lines are going to be muted to minimize background noise. We will save time after the presentation for your questions. If questions come up during the presentation, you are welcome to use the questions feature on the GoToWebinar to submit comments as we go. So take a moment now to find the questions tool on the dashboard. At the end of Monique's talk, I will share as many of your questions as time allows for her to answer. If we have unanswered questions at the end, we'll follow up with the written answers. If you'd like to receive the slides from today's presentation, please let us know during the survey that will appear at the end of today's session. As soon as the webinar is done, you'll have the option to complete a survey. And as you do that, that will trigger a send of the slides to you. A recording of this webinar will be available on the excelix.com website within a day or two. Excellent. That's it for housekeeping now for the main event. So today, we are very pleased to have with us, all the way from Brisbane, Australia, Dr. Monique Beatles. Monique will be presenting about the Board of Directors' role in asset management. Dr. Beatles is an experienced company director with more than 20 years of board experience. She's a fellow of the Australian Institute of Company Directors and the author of Asset Management for Directors, published by AICD. Monique is currently a non-executive director of the Asset Management Council, Queensland Division, director of the Asset Institute, and an industry fellow in the QUT School of Management, where she earned her PhD in strategy. She established her strategy consulting practice, TQU, in 2004. She's a certified asset management assessor and has extensive experience with strategic asset management and in industries, including mining, rail, ports, utilities, and defense. I first came to learn about Dr. Beatles through her book. She also has an excellent series of articles available on her website about the board's role in asset management. So good morning, Monique, and thank you so much for joining us. Let's see if Monique's audio is on. Good morning, Leah. It's a pleasure okay. to be with you. Very good. Now, of course, it's afternoon for most of the folks in the States, 
but uh, as people can see on the map here, you're in Brisbane, which is on the west mid coast of Australia in Queensland territory. And yes, it's, uh, on, on the east coast, um, uh, north of Sydney. Um, yeah. Well, thank you, because I know there's a big time difference and I greatly appreciate you joining us for this webinar today. Yeah, it's 7 a.m. here at the moment. So <laughs> nice, nice and early for me. Nice and early, indeed. Um, before we get started, I'd like to kind of assess where the audience is at regarding today's presentation. If you'll forward over to the next slide, we're going to launch a poll with everyone here about how involved on your end, your company's board of directors is in asset management. So you should see in front of you at this point, some radio buttons, please select the one that is the most relevant for you. How involved is your company's board of directors in asset management? So while people are asking that question, I'm gonna ask you, Monique, another question on the side, because I was very, I was very curious about how, how this particular topic came to be your focus. I know you've been doing this for a long time, but what drove you to explore specifically the board of directors role in asset management? Uh, thanks, Leah. Um, well, as you've already mentioned, I've, I've got 20 years of board experience and so uh, also with a PhD in strategy, that's where a lot of my work is. Um, I do a lot of work with boards and executive teams in terms of their strategic planning and their strategic asset management. Uh, and so in terms of the book, what I found was that there was a gap there, um, that there's a lot of technical literature regarding asset management, which tends to have mostly an engineering focus. Um, and then, of course, you have uh, a wide array of, of management literature, which is more general for business, but there was nothing um, that bridged the gap between these yep. two. And yep. so um, that's... That's where I, uh, I wrote this book in order to address that gap and say, well, what does the board and the executive team, um, what, what do they need to be aware of in terms of asset management and their role? Um, so uh, that's, where it, that's where it came from um, to, to meet that need. I've also found that it's very useful for um, asset management specialists in um, communicating with the board because it helps them to understand the board's perspective. That makes great sense. And I am really looking forward to this because you're exactly right. There's definitely a gap there. And the more we all learn about it, the more we, more we realize how critical it is. Yes. Well, here's the answers to our first poll. Take a minute to look at that. And I'm really glad to see that we do have involvement for about a quarter of our of our participants. That's great. And well, actually almost 40, over 40% have some degree of involvement and then 20, 22% are very involved. So that's a, that's great footing. And uh, I think that I am going to hide this now and turn it over to you and off we go. Okay, uh, great. Thanks, Leah. Um, look, I, it's excellent to hear that a lot of you have responded that your board does have um, some involvement, um, moderately or, or very involved in asset management. Um, so that's fantastic to hear. I, I think what I find um, in the work that I do is there's, of course, a spectrum and that it depends often on um, the nature of your business, um, how important are assets to your business model. Um, and so for some companies which are quite asset heavy, um, you'll often find that then there's much uh, higher level engagement, um, particularly if, for example, you do have um, a dedicated asset management executive in your C-suite who reports directly to the CEO. Um, that's usually an indicator that it's taken quite seriously uh, by the company. Um, <clears throat> of course, though, you, you get the other end of the spectrum as well, um, which is um, those who, who don't really um, have that much involvement or see it as a, a technical task that's um, done by engineering and um, is not really something they need to worry about too much. Um, so uh, that's great. Thanks for your feedback on that. Um, I'm going to start just by giving an overview um, of, and this um, 
this diagram, I, I think, helps to explain um, how the various pieces of the asset management system uh, fit together. Now, I know many of you will be familiar with the ISO 55000 um, international standards, um, which really define what best practice for an asset management system is. Um, and so what you can see, this, this is really to simplify that and to um, clarify where the various parts um, connect. So you can see in those white boxes at the top, um, you've got your company's overriding vision and values, sometimes will be called mission or purpose. Um, so you've got those overarching um, things there, which your company is all about. That's why you're here, it's what you do. Then at the next level, uh, you have a series of corporate objectives, which are part of your strategic plan. And um, they are set out um, and they apply for the whole business. At the next level, um, especially in a larger organisation, you may then have a series of business plans, perhaps for different divisions, different geographical areas, um, different product streams, and so on. Um, and so generally you'll have um, an executive who's responsible for their particular area, has their own business plan, but it, um, of course, relates back to those overall corporate objectives and fits in them to say, well, how do we progress those objectives within our particular um, area? Then at the next level where you have uh, the green items there, um, in the middle we have the strategic asset management plan. That's what it's called in the ISO standard, but um, it can be called many things. Um, it doesn't really matter what its name is, but uh, essentially uh, there's a plan that's at the centre of your asset management system and its purpose is to translate the company's overall objectives and um, strategic intent into your asset management objectives and then to um, outline how you will go about doing that. So it's a really core uh, document, um, uh, an artefact within your system, um, but it really then uh, bridges that gap between what the company is here to achieve and what needs to be done from an asset management perspective. Then um, on either side of that, uh, we've got on the left your asset management policy, uh, which as, as a management system um, in the ISO scheme, your asset management policy sits alongside many other policies that your company might have. Uh, for example, you may have a workplace health and safety policy, a, an environmental policy, um, uh, quality policy, diversity policy. So there, there'll be a series of other policies that you may have and your asset management policy sits at that level um, and uh, ideally it should be signed off by the CEO. So it's, um, it's uh, embedded in the organisation at, at that high level as something that everybody um, needs to ascribe to. On the other uh, side on the right there are the asset management fundamentals, um, which are really uh, industry standards of best practice, which are embedded in the ISO standard. Um, and I will um, go into those in a little bit more detail um, shortly. Uh, so all of those items, your, your business plan coming from your corporate objectives, your asset management policy, which is really about the principles by which you say, here's how we do asset management. Um, and then your fundamentals, which are across industry. So it doesn't matter what sort of company you're in or, or whether it's government or corporate or, or other types of organisations, that these all um, contribute to then what your um, SAMP, as it's generally called, will look like. Out of that then flow um, in the two lower circles there, your asset management plans, which um, then is your um, life cycle approach. So um, a lot of your technical um, plans that you have for each of your assets, however you might define that, um, then, then comes there. So this is when you start to say, all right, here's a, a plan, whole of life plan for you know, 
uh, set A, B, C, and you can have many, many, many of these. Um, but that is where then the, the technical aspects of individual assets um, start to be addressed. But in, in terms of um, what this diagram is trying to illustrate is that those plans flow from the strategic asset management plan and they demonstrate how um, those asset management plans will meet, uh, contribute to meeting those asset management objectives and then through that your overall corporate objectives. So that's where that sits and then, then on the other side on the right we have our asset management systems. So. Um, and not to be confused with the asset management system as a management system, but we often have um, other, we have business processes, we have um, uh, various uh, tools and applications that help us to do our work. Um, we'll have uh, flow charts and checklists and procedures and all of those types of things um, that are about how we do our work of asset management um, and they also then form part of that overall system. So that's just an overview um, which I hope um, is clear to everybody. Uh, I then just will um, think about well uh, who does what in this scheme and therefore what's what's the board's role. So um, in terms of I've already mentioned that the asset management policy should be signed off by the CEO. You know, you'll often see this is a one page document that you can literally put on the wall um, and it has the CEO's signature on it. Um, so it's really one of those indicators that the company is committed um, to asset management and this is what that means for us. Um, However, you know, there's something that's going to be signed off by the CEO. There should be consultation with the board. The board should be aware of it. They should, they should approve it. They should agree with it. Um, they're not going to write it, um, but they should be engaged in the process of um, setting the asset management policy and ensuring that that policy is consistent with other company policies and the overall um, direction that the board wants to set for the company. Uh, likewise, the corporate objectives are set by the board um, in consultation with the CEO. Um, the process of that varies enormously depending on the organisation, um, but it's generally an iterative process. So um, there'll be work back and forth between the executive and the, and the board to develop and um, set those corporate objectives but ultimately the board needs to sign off on them and um, they will then become um, what, what the company is set to follow. Uh, likewise the vision and values that is generally less often so um, you know hopefully your vision and values once you've set up are somewhat enduring and uh, although they may you know change at some point if necessary because of uh, various factors, um, they're usually uh, quite enduring whereas our objectives will change more frequently and then the business plans again um, tend to have a shorter timeline. Um, so all of those items are things that are set by the board um, with consultation and, and input um, from the CEO and the executive team. Um, then the business plans, as I've already mentioned, that this is in the context of plans that uh, an individual executive might have responsibility for. Um, and so they will develop those plans for their own area, but they will consult uh, with the CEO and the board about um, to ensure there's alignment um, with the other areas and, and with the company's overall direction. So again, that, that's an iterative um, process. The asset management fundamentals we've already mentioned, they are an industry standard which will be um, universal uh, across industries and companies. Um, and then uh, these two uh, 
circles here, which we've talked about the asset management plans and the systems. These are very much the technical components. And so they're um, generally developed and implemented by asset management professionals and technical specialists who um, have the necessary expertise with those particular assets that are uh, that are being that are involved and um, are able to um, set those plans and um, develop those um, various processes that are required um, in order to manage those assets. So that um, brings together the various pieces and where they fit and uh, it's, it's important here to see the connection between uh, what's happening um, at, at the the top of the business and then what's going on um, in the day-to-day -day operations. Um, and I usually talk about it in saying that that's this clear line of sight between the boardroom and the workshop floor. Um, how do we know that what we're doing is contributing um, to the overall direction of the business? And that's all about um, taking a strategic perspective. So I just want to touch on now the uh, asset management fundamentals. Uh, now, many of you may already be familiar with these. They come from the ISO 55000, but I'll recap them in the context of thinking about what is the board's role in asset management. Uh, so the first one is value. That value can be financial, non-financial, maybe tangible, or it may be intangible. So value is not just about dollars. Um, there's many other ways that value can be represented. Um, and we need to think about what value do the assets provide to the organisation? Uh, and this always needs to be taken in the context of our stakeholders. So it's important to define who are your stakeholders and what do they value? There's, from, the, from an asset management perspective, we usually talk about value by saying we create value um, by decreasing costs, by decreasing risks, or by improving performance. So what is it that your customers, stakeholders, shareholders, community, government, uh, the vast array of um, stakeholders that uh, have some vested interest in what you're doing, um, what does value mean from their perspective? And of course, what we find is that there are often competing um, perceptions of value. Um, customers want lower prices, but employees want higher salaries. Um, so there's always trade-offs and the board uh, has an important role in um, using their judgment to make decisions about how those trade-offs will be managed. Um, and so the question of what value means um, is a really important one. The second one is alignment. Um, so we already talked about having that line of sight. Um, I think it's important though to consider that alignment is both vertical and horizontal. So it's not just about the board um, or the executive saying this is what we're going to do and everybody else needing to follow it. Um, although from you know from to a certain extent yes that happens but um, in terms of that iterative process that I talked about before, there needs to be two-way communication. Um, things are both top down, but always also bottom up. Um, the important thing though, is that um, if, you, if you want to take an integrated approach um, to asset management, that we have to also think about horizontally um, in a traditional organisational type um, structure that um, there needs to be engagement with colleagues across functional areas, um, that it's not just about the uh, asset management department, if you have one, um, saying, oh yes, well, we're doing that. Um, in fact, it needs to engage people across the business. Uh, and so uh, I, I like to say that um, delegation is not integration. <laughs> um, so what you sometimes will find is that, um, you know, someone at a higher level will split up the tasks and, and uh, dish them out to a number of different areas and then say, okay, they're done. Um, whereas in fact, the, the cooperation and engagement um, between different areas within an organisation is really important um, to getting this true alignment um, if we're all uh, aiming to be working towards the same objectives in the end. 
that's that's alignment and um, then leadership um, is also one of those four fundamentals and this is really critical um, because there needs to be a commitment from all levels of management um, in order to achieve those objectives so often when alignment doesn't happen um, what I see uh, in the work that I do or where that um, line of sight isn't really happening uh, where there isn't good engagement across um, different functional areas um, it's usually because there's been um, there hasn't been that full or genuine commitment um, from all levels of the leadership. Um, so it's, there's an important role for um, leaders at every level to um, set an example and to um, demonstrate their commitment through the way they allocate resources, um, but also by actively engaging themselves um, across the organisation. So, you know, you can ask questions like, um, can a technician on the factory floor articulate their role in asset management? Uh, you know, do, do they know um, what, they're, what part they're playing in that bigger picture? Or are they just focused on doing their technical job? Um, and likewise, can a board director do the same? Does a board director understand the importance of that technical work to the overall objectives of the company? Um, and can uh, a board director um, articulate their own role uh, in asset management and the role of the board? So I think those are interesting questions um, to ask as a bit of a gauge as to um, where you're sitting um, with this. The fourth asset management fundamental is assurance. And this is really saying, well, how do we know that our assets and also the asset management system can deliver what they need to deliver because we've set objectives at the start, uh, we've um, decided where we want to go, we've allocated resources and particularly from the board's point of view because the board's often quite distant from the day-to-day -day operations. Um, for myself as a board director, how can I be assured that uh, risks are being managed, that um, objectives that we've set are in fact being pursued. Um, how do we monitor that? How do we ensure we have um, good reporting? How do we make sure we're getting the right information, uh, that data is being collected, that we uh, have visibility of the information that we need to make decisions? Um, so how do we monitor performance and also then um, ensure continual improvement? And that continual improvement is not just for individual assets themselves, where of course we can improve, um, you know, we can make <clears throat> adjustments or um, improvements to an individual machine or piece of equipment. Um, likewise, we can improve our processes um, to make them more efficient. Um, but this also applies to the asset management system as a whole. Um, if you think about that a diagram that I showed at the beginning. So how do we assure ourselves that the system is robust, that the system is achieving what it needs to achieve, and um, how do we continually improve that system itself? So uh, I think those are important things to consider from the assurance point of view. So this is a, a summary of those asset management fundamentals that I've just spoken about. Um, these are the definitions that um, come out of the standard itself. Um, and so that's just there as a reference. So uh, we have another question now to ask you um, in terms of how confident do you feel in communicating the benefits of asset management to senior levels at, at your company? Um, I've spoken about uh, why that's important and how about how there needs to be that alignment and engagement. Um, so from your point of view, and I, I recognise people will sit at various different, um, in various different roles um, within the company, um, but how do you feel about that? So I expect you're going to tell us, Monique, that it's a two-way street and uh, that, um, like you said earlier, different people have different sides of the knowledge base, right? Yes, that's right. Um, mm -hmm. and, and it's important to recognise that, yes, people have different sides, but they're all important. Yes. Um, and exactly. so we need to... Um, 
we need to recognise that and we need to be open to um, you know, listening to our colleagues and what they have to say from their particular area of expertise. Uh -huh. uh, and uh, there needs to be um, a common language um, because often the barriers are that, you know, engineer, engineers are talking in engineer speak and <laughs> accountants are talking better. in accountants speak and uh, they don't understand what each other is saying. Um, right. So developing common language is an important part of that. Um, and I think in terms of building confidence, um, uh, it's, it's being able to understand the, the perspective um, of, of that other party in terms of what they bring um, to the conversation. Well, let's take a look at these results. Again, this is an excellent audience because it seems as though people are already having this conversation. Yeah, that's fantastic. Right, 37% are very confident they're communicating these benefits and 41% are moderately confident. That's fantastic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's excellent. Um, that's really great to see. Um, what, what I find is generally what this means is that when you are uh, doing that communication, when you're um, trying to send a message to senior levels, um, you need to have less of a technical focus and more of a focus on the value, uh, as I spoke about earlier, um, because that's what's important from decision makers' point of view um, in terms of their obligations to stakeholders that they need to meet. Yeah. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Yeah. So. All right. Well, feel free to carry on at this point because okay. I know you've got a few more good things for us. Yep. Fantastic. All right. Thanks very much, everyone, for contributing to that. Uh, that's great. Okay. So um, I've spoken about the asset management system. I've spoken about uh, those fundamentals. Um, I now want to delve a little bit more into um, specifically the board's role. Um, now, this model here um, is Tricker's model of governance roles. Um, I, I've modified it slightly just to to make it simple and clear here. Um, but essentially, this answers the question of what does the board do? Uh, what, what is the board's role um, in the company? And what are the various aspects that the board needs to consider? You see there that it looks to the future and to the past. It looks both externally and internally. And so the four quadrants that we look at there then are our strategy, um, which is about setting direction. Um, we look at policy, which is about um, translating that direction internally into uh, processes and practices. Um, we look externally to, to risk and how we manage risk. Um, and then there's also compliance obligation that um, the boards need to meet. Um, uh, compliance reporting, uh, you know, a whole lot of regulatory um, obligations that uh, that you will have. Um, and so what a board needs to do is that they need to balance these four things because, again, they can compete. So uh, while we might really find it exciting to spend our time um, in that strategy area, looking ahead and, and setting grand plans, and that's really important, um, but we need to ensure that we're also meeting our compliance obligations and uh, maintaining, you know, safety and our financial reporting and all that sort of thing. Um, what can happen, though, is the opposite, where uh, because compliance obligations are, um, are regulated and mandated, um, the board can end up spending a lot of their time in that particular quadrant, and then they don't spend enough time on the strategic thinking that they need to be doing, um, or, or likewise, um, managing risk. Um, as I said, I modified this a bit, but in Tricker's original model in the centre, there's a circle with the CEO. And it's just to indicate that the board works with and through the CEO. So that relationship between the board and the executive is really critical. Um, and like I said earlier, you may or may not have a dedicated executive for asset management. Um, but if you do, then that um, creates that link at that level. Otherwise, you need to know well, which executive is responsible for that. Uh, you know, is it the, is it the CFO? Um, is there a, a chief engineering person? Um, so on. So um, 
So that, this is in terms then of the different roles that the board um, needs to take on uh, at their particular level. And um, what I've done, um, and again, as uh, Leah mentioned earlier in my, my book, An Asset Management for Directors, uh, what I've put forward here is an integrated model. So what this now does is it takes Tricker's model of the roles of the board and it takes the asset management fundamentals that we've been through and it layers them on top of one another. So what it shows is how the governance roles of the board align with the fundamentals of asset management. And uh, what I believe then is that board directors are asset managers because they are entrusted by the shareholders with the assets of the company and their job is to generate value from those assets. Um, whether that's a return on investment in a, uh, in a corporate environment or whether that's delivering services uh, from a government perspective um, and so on. Uh, but what the model really does is to say, um, the board has a critical role in asset management and in fact there's alignment between what the board already does and what their accepted role is um, and what's required from an asset management point of view. So you can see there that value, um, the strategic aspect is all about how do we create value um, in our particular market. Uh, policy um, is really that alignment aspect, um, how do we translate that. Then we have assurance which is both external and internal. So so compliance is part of that, uh, managing risk is part of that and then leadership really sits around um, the outside because that is all encompassing. Um, all board directors need to um, take a leadership role and without that none of this will happen. Uh, so just then to go into these in a little bit more detail, again taking that specific view of um, from a board's perspective, knowing that these are the areas they focus on, um, what does that mean for them in asset management? Um, so this picture here of Harry Truman, uh, President Harry Truman, who famously had on his desk this uh, sign which says, the buck stops here. And um, I also have a quote from him saying that, it's easy for the Monday morning quarterback to say what the coach should have done after the game is over. But when the decision's up before you, the decision has to be made. And so I think that this reflects um, the situation that the board is in because the buck also stops with the board. They don't have anyone else who they can um, go to to make the decision for them. And although they're um, elected or appointed by the shareholders, just as the president is elected by the people, um, but ultimately their job is to make these decisions and it requires judgment. Um, if it was easy, um, it would have already been delegated. So there's often trade-offs that need to be made and um, that's where leadership is really important. The next one is the strategy role um, and uh, so this is really about looking forward, looking to opportunities, um, saying what, what um, trends are in the external environment, uh, what's going on in our market or in other markets beyond um, our particular industry that might impact us in the future, um, what do our customers need, what do they value um, and therefore how do we ensure that we create that for them. Um, and so this requires an outward looking perspective, um, which goes beyond the um, you know, technical aspects that we might um, traditionally focus on, um, but to say, okay, um, what, what is it out there that we need to respond to? How can we um, in fact be a first mover in some of these things? How can we um, be disrupted rather than, uh, how can we be a disruptor rather than being disrupted? Um, so those are the, the types of things that the board needs to consider um, from this perspective. We then have risk um, and look, I often say to people from an asset management point of view that risk is often a good conduit. Um, if you're looking to open a dialogue with the board or uh, with the executive level, um, that risk is um, something that is very high on the priority list 
for board. And given that asset management is a risk-based discipline um, and that it's an important way of managing risk, um, if, especially where you have a lot of significant assets, um, then I think that if you're in the early stages of feeling that um, you're not sure about how to start that conversation, this can often be uh, a good starting point. Um, because the board, again, it needs to satisfy itself that systems are in place. Um, because um, as a director, if something that if something goes terribly wrong, um, I'm the one who's going to lose my house or go to jail. You know, so directors are very concerned with risk management. And so um, this, this is an important aspect. I think as well, we need to look at um, all matters of risk, not just operational risks. We need to look at um, strategic risks as well. And I think um, one of the ones that's important in asset management is the stranded asset risk. Um, so we're seeing that um, a lot now that it's something that we need to say, well, hey, we could maintain this asset, we could extend its life, but will it still be creating value? Um, in Australia, you know, we're a major coal exporter. We have um, uh, majority coal-fired power and for power generators now that have ageing assets um, that, you know, they may have once said, oh, this has got a 30-year life and we want to extend it to 40 years, um, but the question board needs to now ask is, will, some, will someone, will, you know, the community still want that power coming from that coal-fired generator in 40 years time? And if that's not what's going to, um, going to happen, then you need to reconsider those decisions, um, despite that the asset might have a viable technical life, uh, you know, it may become politically or economically redundant. So these are the types of things that the board needs to consider in making those decisions. Uh, from a policy uh, perspective, um, this is a picture of the Ritz Hotel in Paris, where I went with uh, on on my honeymoon um, with my husband. And look, it's just a, an excellent example because um, Ritz was really good at um, embedding the values of the organisation. Um, in every level um, of the staff. So um, he said, I want my hotel to be a place where a prince will feel at home. Um, and so then every decision uh, made about the, the curtains, the furniture, the carpet, the, you know, uh, every little decision um, is aligned to that overall vision. Um, so I, I think that's a, um, a, a good example of that of how a policy and uh, policy itself translates though that overarching vision and objectives that we looked at at the beginning into what do we do on a daily basis you know what kind of cutlery do we have you know how quickly should we serve people how many uh, waiters do we need and so on um, so that's the policy aspect and again the, the board needs to be involved in in setting that direction but then ensuring it's resourced um, in order to be able to achieve that. Um, compliance is the final one. I put this as a photo from New York but I put that there because I think um, boards can often feel snowed under um, by the weight of their compliance obligations um, and although they're really necessary um, it's important that we, um, uh, we take um, you know, a rational approach to what is necessary and um, and without um, getting uh, yeah, bogged down by it, snowed under, without leaving no time for those other aspects of strategy and, and policy and risk that it's also really important for the board to consider. So I'll just... Um, Summarise now, um, as we, um, as I asked you earlier, how confident do you feel about um, communicating the benefits of asset management to senior levels? And it's really great to see that uh, most of you were quite confident about that. Um, this is just a, a bit of a summary, um, if you'd like to use it for talking points, um, in terms of the benefits of asset management to decision makers. So again, across those four areas, it creates value. It aligns objectives to other decisions, it 
helps to reduce risk. Um, that can be useful with your insurance company or with regulators uh, or in other aspects. Um, and it helps you to maintain your compliance obligations because it ensures that you have a system in place um, that will allow you to do that. It creates accepted principles for how decisions are made and also agreed decision pathways. So um, part of what you um, design and set up when you're um, building an asset management system is those um, decision pathways. Um, includes delegations of authority, um, but also in terms of well, what are the factors we need to consider, who is going to be responsible for decisions at different levels. Um, it ensures that there's a focus on the corporate objectives because of the way they're connected through that line of sight. And it makes sure that this, the framework for implementing it is robust. Um, and again, as I've also mentioned, that there's a common language and that is hugely valuable um, because if we all know what each other's talking about, then we'll get um, a lot further, a lot faster. Um, the ISO standard talks about top management. Um, partly it's because um, uh, when you're developing an international standard across 27 or 28 countries with many languages, um, the terminology that's used needs to be able to translate into to various languages. So the standard calls it top management and it's the personal group of people who directs and controls an organisation at the highest level. And what's important is that they have the power to delegate authority, but also provide resources. So usually this will be um, the board and the CEO or the board and the executive. Um, and that's who we mean when we talk about top management. It'll depend obviously on the context. Sometimes it might be a government minister or and so on, depending on, um, for example, if you're a government department. Um, but whoever that might be, they are the ones who take on these board level roles. The responsibilities, um, I've listed them there. They go through um, what we've already talked about, um, decision making at that high level where it needs to be escalated as determined by your decision making system setting and approving the policy, um, ensuring there's review, um, endorsing processes, and also um, taking on those high level risks, um, making sure reporting requirements are clear, are set, are, are followed, are monitored, um, assigning those responsibilities, and also um, being engaged in that audit and continuous improvement um, process. So management review is part of that, but also, um, you know, making sure that that system is in place so that you know that the system is being continuously improved. Um, so that's all part of um, what that top management needs. They don't need to do these things, but they need to ensure that they're in place um, and they need to uh, be engaged and involved in making decisions on these aspects. Because finally, um, the overall primary responsibility of that top management group is to ensure the alignment of asset management practices with the overall corporate objectives, which brings us back to where we started um, with the diagram that showed us how those different parts of an asset management system um, connect to each other. So um, I will leave it there in terms of my presentation. Uh, I did, uh, sorry, I have, I'll just go through that um, to the next slide. Um, I've already mentioned my book, Asset Management for Directors. It's published by the Australian Institute of Company Directors. Uh, it is available um, as a Kindle book on Amazon. Um, but if you'd like a hard copy that uh, can be ordered from the from the company directors um, in Australia. Um, I also just wanted to mention that I do, as Leah has already said, I do have some resources which are uh, available to download for free from my website. Um, if you go there and you click on the resources page, um, I do have an article series on the board's role in asset management. There's also a number of other things there, for example, uh, some guidelines for preparing a proposal for the board. Um, if you're in the situation where you need to um, submit 
uh, business case or other types of proposals to the board that just gives you a few guidelines for what you might need to consider. Also some of my research papers in these topic areas so please feel free to have a look at those um, if you do find them useful. Great. Thank you very much, Monique. I do have a couple of questions from the audience, uh, if you don't mind. Good. Uh, this was an interesting one. Um, has it? Have you ever seen an instance where a board has gotten too involved in asset management? Does that happen, and, and how do you do with it? Well, um, this can happen in any area where a board um, gets to. Uh, too involved in the technical aspects. You might find that that is most likely to happen if a board member happens to have a technical background right. and therefore because it's what they know, um, they like to get down into the detail. Um, mm -hmm. Now there's always a fine line that a board has to walk um, between um, taking an active interest and being fully informed as they absolutely need to be but then on the other hand uh, not interfering in management's work um, and so this can be something that can be problematic um, it can cause conflict between management and the board if the management feels they're that the board is overstepping the mark but the board feels like they're um, being stonewalled, you know, so that that's a, a negotiation that needs to happen. Um, and the it's really critical that especially the relationship between the chairman and the CEO. Now, I know that in the US, they're often the same person. Uh, but in Australia, that's not the case. Um, we will usually always have two different people. Um, so I guess if you're the same person, then that relationship is much easier to manage. <laughs> <laughs> that was actually another question that came in. Um, uh, did you see a lot of variation between how boards were managed and how involved they were from one country to the next? Uh, well, look, I think that there are variations in corporate governance from the perspective that, you know, legislation is different um, and that type of thing. Um, you know, in Europe, they have uh, management boards. They have a lot more. Um, uh, they have uh, employee representatives on their board. And so, you know, the structure um, and the processes that they use are a little bit different. Um, you find that Australia is quite aligned with the UK generally because our legal system comes from there. Um, and so um, you, you'll often find that um, they're quite similar. Um, you know, I'm aware that, um, yes, obviously in the US that's, there's some differences in terms of who takes on those roles, but yeah. on the whole, the principles are the same. Okay. Um, so in terms of the role that the board takes on, um, you know, in terms of that trigger model um, is, is quite universal. Um, often the, the question will be, well, who, which particular body is in fact the board? Um, because sometimes there can be quite complex, um, you know, series of different committees and um, so on, especially if you have, you know, subsidiaries and um, multiple legal entities. Um, sometimes it can be, okay, well, who is ultimately the decision maker right. in this structure? Uh, so sometimes right. that's the challenge. But, um, so speak, speaking of that, again, and our, our questions are sort of lining up here, um, I have a, a question that, that asks uh, how you feel about ISO 55000. Um, I, I think it's asking for your opinion on the standard. For my opinion on the standard. <laughs> um, okay, so, um, well, look, I'm, I'm happy to, you know, give some perspective. Um, I think what we know internationally is that Australia has um, had good uptake of the standard. Um, likewise, in some of the Euro European countries, the Netherlands, also Japan, um, there's been good uptake um, in terms of companies certifying to the standard. Um, I understand that in the US that uptake has been far lower, yes. um, that there are only perhaps five companies so far that have um, certified to the standard. So I think that's interesting to think about why is that. Mm. Um, in Australia, look, and, and there's um, uh, 
uh, there's a lot of aspects to it, but I, I think from my perspective, as uh, from the perspective of a director and also, uh, you know, as an asset management specialist that um, I, I say that the company should always ask the question why, you know, why do we need to um, certify to this standard or why do we need to align with the standard? What I find in my work is that a lot of companies um, aren't necessarily seeking to be certified, but what they're doing is that they're using the standard as a, as a basis for best practice. So they're saying we will take um, what's in the standard and we will use it um, as a framework to design our asset management system to ensure that we have everything in place um, because they don't really want to go through the certification process, which of course has time and expense right. and, and all of those other factors, unless they have a compelling reason to do so. Um, yeah. So it, that may be because your customers require it. Um, and in Australia, a number of governments have not mandated the standard, but they've created their own framework, which is aligned to the standard, which essentially says, this is how you need to do things. Mm -hmm. um, so you, you might find over time that let's say if you are a service provider to large corporations or government that they may require you to have it and then that becomes a, a reason for you to have to do it. But I think even if you don't have those um, imperatives, um, in ter I, I believe it is a good framework for best practice. Um, I use it in my own work to say, okay, uh, to assess um, where a company is at from the point mm -hmm. of view of mm -hmm. um, uh, doing asset management in the best possible way. So I, I think um, I think the standard is is good. It's been developed over a long period um, with you know quite in depth consultation across the world. Um, I think again, you know, therefore it's necessarily generic. Um, because it needs to be able to apply equally to, right. you know, a Fortune 500 company as it does to a small family business. Right. So, right. Um, so therefore, th but that's the nature of the nature of the standard. Um, it's, it's not prescriptive, um, and so some people are, are critical of that because they are looking for um, more direction on what to do, and the standard doesn't give you that. But uh, what it does give you, though, is it gives you um, the, its strength is that it gives you flexibility um, that it says, well, here's what to do, but not how to do it. Or here are the things to have in place um, without, uh, you know, the ISO trying to prescribe how you should run your business. That's not what it's for. Um, it's there as a tool to mm -hmm. support, not there to be prescriptive about the way people should do things. That makes sense. That makes sense. Yeah. So I hope I hope that has answered the question. <laughs> but um, it, I think it, I think it did. I think it did. And I've got another question that's just come in. Um, um, and apologies to the the audience member if I don't get this quite right. But um, let's say that uh, that uh, there is a gap in communication between the plant and Hello, um. and um, and the board, and you're looking, and both times. Hello. Sorry, you just dropped out for have a I moment. Lost you? There. Yes. Hello. Can you hear me? Oh. I can hear you just fine. Can you hear me? Oh, great. Yes. I'm sorry, I did lose you for a moment there. I don't think you missed a thing. So I'm going to rephrase my last question because we've got a couple more minutes here. So let's let's say that. Um, that uh, a gap has been identified between the board and uh, the asset managers and uh, both sides want to put a better asset management policy into place. How long should, uh, should you expect that to take? Uh, if you're going to uh, create a new one from scratch um, or I'm just not sure whether, whether this question is asking um, to create a new one from scratch or to revise an existing one. Probably either way, it doesn't matter. I I think that um, you need to make sure that there's adequate 
consultation um, and that a process that you work through um, in order to do that. Um, so it doesn't need to take a really long period of time, provided that you um, have genuine engagement. Um, okay. So you could do that over a number of workshops, um, then some drafts and, you know, feedback back and forth. You could do it in, let's say, a month um, if, you know, but it, it, that's just the policy document itself um, standalone. Um, obviously, though, it's often part of a, a bigger piece of work to um, designing the system, um, developing the SAMP and so on. Um, sure. But the policy, the policy itself, um, it provided that you, um, yeah, do, do that consultation and engagement um, shouldn't take uh, an enormous amount of time. Okay. Well, great. I'm, I'm going to ask you the last question and then we'll fold. Um, the last question is, if you have a board who needs to be pulled more into the strategy quadrant, more into the asset conversation, you just mentioned workshops, for example, are there some, some words or phrases that you use or some tactics that you use to pull a board back into a more engaged asset uh, framework? Well, I think uh, an important question to put people into that um, more strategic uh, framework um, is to ask why. So, uh, as, as I just said before regarding the standard, you know, from my point of view, I always say, okay, why? What's our imperative here? What's our rationale? How does this al um, help us to move towards our objectives? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so, I, I think that um, because, you know, uh, what can happen is if you get down into that compliance policy, oh, well, we're just doing this because we have to, we're doing it because it's the way we've always done it, we do it you know, because it's the way yes. everybody does it, they, they are all not good reasons. So, um, so I think, you know, particularly from a director's perspective and in saying, you know, we want to move this up, why, why, what's the benefit, um, what's the value that this is going to create? Good. Um, that, that's the important question that, that we need to ask. Great, thank you. Well, if you will forward one more slide, um, I want to reassure folks that as soon as I close the webinar today, they're going to receive a, a quick online survey. And by filling out that survey, you guarantee that you'll receive a copy of these slides. Um, I also want to recommend that people do go to Monique's site because those articles are really helpful. They, you know, if you're looking at this process and you want to take the next steps, they're gonna be great resources for you. So thank you again for joining us and thank you, Monique. This was great. I learned a bunch. And um, as you say, the standard hasn't progressed as far in North America as it has elsewhere. So I appreciate the insight you gave us. Excellent. Uh, you're welcome, Leah. It's been a pleasure. Very good. All right. Thank you, everyone. Have a good rest of your day and thank you for joining us. Take care. Bye-bye.